Bring your friends and your folks along Down to the river and sing this song River Fest, it's the best Hello, my name is Kevin Hoyt. I am the interim director here at Fort Swallowbond Historical Park. Uh, our mission here is to educate about the history of the fur trade and the interaction with the native peoples. Uh, on our site we have two fur posts that were rebuilt on the actual footings of the original fur posts that were here from 1802 to 1805. Um, the fur posts were run by the XY Company and the Northwest Company. They were only here for three years before the XY Company moved further out west to the Snake River fur post over in present-day Pine City. Uh, we do school tours here every spring and every fall. Usually around five to six hundred children come through and learn about the fur trade. We have on display uh, many of the artifacts here in the, that were found here on the site. Uh, we also have examples of some of the foods that they were eating, uh, including what they traded from the natives. We also have on display some of the furs, some of the traps, uh, some of the beadwork, lots of the trade goods of the era. Um, and all this was brought from overseas and brought up from Montreal and Quebec by canoe. Uh, it was a very arduous journey, many, many days and weeks to, to get here. They had to come across Lake Superior and then up the Brule River to the St. Croix down the St. Croix to the Yellow, and then up the Yellow to where the fur posts are now. The uh, trip was quite dangerous. There were a lot of rapids and a lot of canoes got tipped over and sank. A lot of trade goods were lost and several lives were lost. Uh, also, uh, one of our famous voyageurs, uh, Pierre Labonga, is a uh, was over here in this area. He was the only black voyager and he was so strong that he could carry five fur bundles at a time. Each fur bundle weighs 90 pounds. Uh, they, most voyagers were required to carry two at a time. That was during portages. Um, let's see. Uh, the canoes that they used to come up here were north canoes they were up to 28 foot long. Uh, once they got to Lake Superior, they used the Montreal canoes. Uh, some of those were up to 30 to 40 foot in length. Uh, the 28 foot Mont or North canoe could hold up to 3,000 pounds of goods plus the men. And it had 10 men to paddle it and then steer it. One of our canoes that we have here it came all the way from New York State. It was brought in by one of the prior, uh, prior directors. Um, we have many examples of the trade goods that were found here in this area that were traded to the Ojibwe. Uh, we have many displays also of other artifacts. Uh, beside me here we have a mannequin dressed up in the clothing that you would find most voyagers would be wearing. Uh, the voyagers wintered here uh, in the fur posts. Uh, they called them pork eaters because they had all they had to eat was uh, salt pork and dried peas. So they ate a lot of pea soup. Okay, this is an example of a birch bark canoe that was made by the natives. Um, it's an Ojibwe style. This one here was actually built by Joe Bearhart and uh, it was made in 1910. It's a beautiful reconstruction of, of a, a miniature construction of a birch bark canoe. Uh, in this case here, you'll find some of the birch bark macucks and wooden spoons that were used in the era. Also a brass tray kettle. And this is a clay pot that was found. Uh, it would have predated the Ojibwe because the Ojibwe here did not use the clay, native clay for their cooking vessels. By the time they got to here, they were using mostly uh, the brass trade kettles. 
Uh, here you'll find some examples of native beadwork and quill work. Uh, some of this very beautiful work that was done from the early 1800s to the late 1800s. We have moccasins, we have a beaded co dance collar, uh, we have pouches, and beautiful examples of quill work down here, which the natives used before they got beads, they'd use porcupine quills that were dyed. Here you'll find a display of some of the foods that were used during the fur trade. The diet of the voyageur. A lot of nuts, dried meat, usually buffalo, uh, pemmican, we've got maize, which is corn, we've got beans, we had dried peas, uh, wild rice was a very big staple. Wild rice is a complete food, uh, you can live just on wild rice. And trading with the natives was one of the ways they acquired their rice. Here you'll see an example of a beaver fur top hat. This is what drove the fur trade. This hat right here. This hat is what killed the fur trade. It's a silk top hat. Once they discovered the silkworm could uh, make a better hat, they stopped using the beaver felt for quite a bit. Now, the beaver felt top hats only used the under fur. The rest of the hair was discarded. To make the hats, they had to separate the under fur from the guard hairs in a process using salts of mercury, which was invariably fatal to the hat maker. So that's where the, the saying, mad as a hatter, comes from. It's because when you die from mercury poisoning, you go crazy first. Here you'll have a examples of many of the furs that we'd have. Uh, this is moose. Up here you have an otter, beavers of course, raccoon, mink, marten, muskrat, coyote, and up here you'll have a bear, a skunk, and the deer. There weren't many white-tailed deer in this area. Uh, there was more woodland elk, woodland buffalo, and caribou, woodland caribou. So the white tail came in with the logging because the, they need more open spaces. And northern Wisconsin was mostly white pine forest. Here you'll see a display about wild rice. It was very important to not only the native peoples, but also the voyageurs. They traded with the natives for the wild rice, otherwise known as menomen. You would gather the rice on the lakes and rivers, parch it, dry it, dehull it and pack it into fawn skins. They would use fawn skins as a unit of measure for trade. Uh, you'll see a winnowing basket here where they would take the, the rice after it had been danced on, shake it, throw it up in the air and catch it again and let the wind blow away all the chaff, all the hulls.